I watch like Jubilee videos and shit. I guess that's what you, if that's what you mean. But there are a million fucking debaters out there and that make debate content, and I rarely ever watch them. And part of the reason why is because I don't think it's like that. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I don't like people that do that. Today we're going to talk about debate or the lack thereof, and why people on the internet, and in particular this website, love it so much. Debate is the oil, coal, and gas of the internet. It ferments amongst the masses in Twitter threads and subreddits. Oops, um, we meant in... Wait, I get called a debater in this? Really? X threads and subreddits. It racks up viral views for streamers like this. I'm sorry? This isn't true. That water has not always been H2O? Yeah, all you have to do is cross the Mexican border. And over there, it's aqua that's H2O. <laughs> It circulates via thought leaders from Daily Wire hosts Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson who combat formidable opponents, i.e. Uh, mostly just stoned college students. Find a better Marxist to emulate than, than Lenin or Stalin, mass murderers. To the majority reports Emma Vick. Wait, why is Lenin? What? Like, like, I get why you're fucking... I get why you're, like, crying about Stalin, okay? That, that makes sense. I mean, also, Stalin was a mass murderer of a lot of Nazis, too, so I don't know why Ben is, like talking about that but but like what's happening with lenin you know like oh lenin uh mass murderer lenin like what the fuck you're just naming names at that point it's literally like it's like when people try to say marx is like a, a dangerous like genocidal maniac i'm like what are you talking about the only thing he genocided was fucking basic hygiene rules like what do you mean what what did he genocide like who did he kill who did marx kill he just posted he posted too hard shut the fuck up Marx killed his own liver? Yeah. He genocided the allowances Engels gave him. Yeah. It's just, like, very obvious that you're talking to an unserious person at that point. Okay? I understand the criticisms directed towards Stalin. There, there are certainly valid ones and certainly plenty that go uh, way above and beyond. But uh, ultimately... Complaining about Lenin is is wild. I, I don't know. Like, what are you supposed to do? Just, like, uh, facilitate a, a, a revolution with kisses? Like, I don't understand. Are you supposed to hug and kiss everybody? And then they're like, oh, we are so sorry. We will, we will allow a, a dictatorship of the proletariat immediately. Here, please, uh, implement workers' councils. Change everything for us. We love this. It's like... What, what is supposed to happen? What, 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 how is that supposed to happen? Like, there is not a single fucking instance of this ever working, okay? Violence is a constant in politics. It's kind of the whole point of politics. It's like with Che. Yeah, exactly. What well, really fucked up what they did. <laughs> Bigeland, who specializes in humiliating conservatives. You're not citing you're not citing science. You're citing government approval. No, I'm not. I am citing that's the, and that's fine. What does that what does the government have to do with that? These are medical organizations. Okay, sure, sure. Fair point. In our age of extreme <laughs> hyperpolarization, sure, sure. fostering dialogue between disagreeing factions seems like a decent idea. But calling online debate an intellectual endeavor feels a little generous, and most of it looks like a nerdy WWE match where you lob words instead of elbow strikes for the purpose of entertaining the masses. So what the hell happened? America has a long history of public debate as a way to keep us informed and give arguments a stress test. So has the internet ruined this valuable form of idea exchange? Is online debate actually useful? I just don't think that it was a very valuable form of idea exchange ever. Useful as a way to refine ideas? Or are we just wasting our time when we tweet our sickest burns at- Oh my God, this is my favorite. This is my favorite. Dennis Prager and that other fucking freak talking about how Dennis Prager thinks like hentai is permissible. Right? Or or wait, does he was it hentai or child pornography that he thought was permissible? It's a fucking insane. Yeah, what's your argument? Prager you. Okay, so let's try to figure this all out in today's video. Did the Oh, it was yeah, lolly hentai. Bro culture kill debate. Okay, before we, we dive further into the debate, I wanted to- This is such a funny video because you know this video is like, this video is like 
writing something that is contentious on subreddits, okay? You know you're about to get paragraphs. You're about to get hit. Like, if I look at the comments of this right now, I suspect that it's filled to the brim with, like, people just being like, you don't understand. Debates is the only form of arriving at the truth. You're a fucking idiot. You're, like, a libtard. That's why you don't get it. Blah, 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 blah. Like, oh, man. All right. Well, Michael, I have lots of different devices that all run on Google on iOS. Tech, your, and it's not your friends. They never the link in the description. Here's you the can, link. P-O-V-P-N dot com slash You get card. private internet access today at 83% off the regular price. That's $2.03 a month. I never have the time to join, but I saw a post about you on Our Conservative today, and people were actually defending you. It was wild. Wait, really? A post about me on Our Conservative? The fuck did I say on... The fuck did I say that would, like, conser get conservatives to defend me? Odd. Month plus, you get four months absolutely free it's a pretty good deal so check out the link in the description stay safe when you're on the internet check out private internet access and now let's get back to the show now to understand debate in america it helps to look at our former unelected overlords in england the parliamentary system started developing rules for debate in the 16th and 17th centuries which back then included an emphasis on politeness and staying on topic now, during the Enlightenment era, an emphasis on reason and rationality and the development of a middle-class public sphere spread the thirst for a good debate amongst the common folk. Now, the nature of debate in America, like oh so many things about us, can actually be traced back to that parliamentary system. According to journalist and author Tom Chapman, our Congress developed as a means of representative debate wherein congressmen were seen as gladiators for their constituents. Now, from our earliest days, the ability to debate was essential to any sense of agreement about our institutions. While debates on the Congress floor at the time certainly weren't always civil, and politicians did dabble in, a, you know, literal canings and duels to the death, their actual rhetorical arguments were focused. Oh, man. Substantive. Now, notably, in early America, most of the real nasty political rhetoric that might sound familiar today was done by partisan newspapers rather than openly by politicians. From the revolution through the early 19th century, congressional speeches and debates were the central source of information for Americans, and newspapers graded these speeches on their eloquence and persuasiveness. But by the mid-19th century, debate spread back to the people via the Lyceum Movement, which was a widespread attempt to cultivate informal educational opportunities for white men who couldn't afford college. It quickly evolved into a forum for debate where scholars and public figures would travel the new railroad lines, spreading their political ideas to the masses. Also, join our Patreon so that we can have enough money to stop making YouTube videos and just send me around the country um, on the rail to give speeches in your hometown. Um, there's a link in the description. Check it out. However, according to Shatman, entertainment began to overtake more reasoned debate. And by the end of the Civil War, Lyceum speakers were more concerned with amusing and delighting the audience than with edifying potential voters. Political speech is entertainment? Who's ever heard of such a thing? I don't know about you, but I'm having a good time. It's crazy. Still, there was an appetite for rational debate, as evidenced by the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates, which spanned long hours, attracted audiences of 10,000, and focused on rigorous argumentation, albeit with some personal attacks and misrepresentations. Overall, though, in the friction surrounding the Civil War, bombastic rhetoric became the name of the game. As Shatman writes, no longer could a distinction be drawn between the performer on the lecture circuit and the politician on the stump, and congressional debates were seen more as duels than intellectual discourse. Again, doesn't it kind of sound familiar? Well, we can't address every <laughs> era of debate in American history because it's simply too complex a web. But suffice to say, American history has been an ongoing, ever-evolving tension between debate as a civil exchange of ideas and debate as often uncivil entertainment. Repeatedly, times of social divisiveness and technology... Debate has never, in my opinion, been a productive way to arrive at a fucking truth, okay? By design, debates that are meant to be consumed by a broader audience are just simply won and lost on the grounds of rhetoric. Whoever is more powerful with their rhetoric wins a debate. Logical change usually have provided the impetus for debates race to the bottom. Take 1960, when Kennedy v. Nixon became the first presidential debate to be televised. 
turning men arguing into a nationwide spectator sport. These debates were replete. I mean, they literally, like, this is the perfect example of what I'm saying, okay? The perfect example of what I'm saying. He's hot, so he won, dog. With dick looked sweaty. He had a sweaty dick. Stump speech riffs composed by the relatively new phenomenon of speech writers. Ironically, Nixon's biggest tactical mistake, according to Chapman, was actually trying to thoughtfully answer some of the questions. Starting in 1966, conservative columnist William F. Buckley rode that wave of America's fascination with televised... Absolute fucking monster demon piece of shit. Like, nobody really does it like him. No one, no one... Oh, my God. Oh, my fucking God, dude. He is... Ah, what a monster. On his also, ultimately... Ultimately, this conversation, the most famous one between him and Gore Vidal, also was basically reduced to him calling Gore Vidal the F word and Gore Vidal calling him, correctly, a fascist, okay? Oh, he didn't say F word, he said queer, I think. But still, like, like that's literally what every debate devolves into. His show, Firing Line which for 33 years balanced reasoned argumentation between intellectuals with rhetorical fallacies and bombacity. Now classic strategies of today's debate bros. Another dude who just looks like a melted down pedophile, by the way. Television turned debating into a war of often abrasive and uncivil sound bites. And by the time we were treated to the internet's first real homegrown president, I'm gonna have to scare the pup. Debate was basically all about performance. The focus of winning the argument by any means, untruths or insults included, had supplanted entirely proving the merit of your ideas. You know, it's a great cure for being super duper hot outside. Being a first world country, amazing. By the 2000s, programs on 24 hour news channels fully leaned into what Stephen Colbert dubbed truthiness, a predilection for facts that feel true, even if they aren't true. I don't trust books. They're all fact, no heart. And indeed, this is defined debate in the internet age. It's just so funny that, like, the old Colbert Report was so good, especially because he just, like, recognized the truth that I recognize, which is that conservatives are way funnier. And, like, laughing at conservatives makes for infinitely better comedy than anything else. You know what I mean? It's just so perfect. And then he just turned into the most pretentious lib, which is awful, you know? kneecapping its original role, which was to logically examine and question our views and beliefs. And what tell- Yeah, no, conservatives were literally fans of him and didn't understand it. It's like conservatives thinking that at the top of the hour, there isn't a three-minute ad break when there is one, you know? Or that I'm Hank Pecker. But as Hank Pecker, of course, I do serve you a three-minute ad break. And if you want to fucking protect yourself from, from the scourge of tyranny, then all you need to do is fucking subscribe for $5 or free with the Twitch Prime. Here's the Thurman Eye Break now. Hell yeah, folks. Yee yeah, yee. Yeah, let's go. Television debate fomented, picked up even more. That was low effort. Man, it's been eight hours. Give me a goddamn break. In the podcast space. Most notably, with folks like Joe Rogan debating guests on conspiracy theories and pseudoscience. Meanwhile, streamers debate YouTubers for hours. And none of these modern debaters seem interested in changing anyone's mind or sometimes even talking about the subject they're supposed to be debating. Instead, the goal is to win a debate by dominating their opponent into submission for clout. If the goal of debate has changed True. from challenging ideas to True. winning, then trivial tactics like citing facts or posing logical arguments, well, no longer works. On both sides of the political aisle, debates now use sophistry, i.e. engaging in fallacious arguments with the intention True. of deceiving others. White House True. Advisor. Okay, facts. True facts stated. This is your take word for word, bar for bar. Yeah, I don't know why they didn't fucking post like me literally bringing up why debates are not won and lost on, on the grounds of facts or, or arriving at the truth, uh, but instead specifically uh, done on the basis of who can justify and hyper-rationalize their logical fallacy faster while rhetorically overpowering their interlocutor. Because that's precisely what it is, okay? Oh, I'm just testing your moral boundaries. It's like, no, you're not. You're trying to currently rationalize a fucking logical fallacy that absolutely has no basis in this conversation. You're also hypocrisy baiting. People say you only debated Tay because it was easy. Yeah, I know. I know they say that. Except I've debated literally 
famous conservative broadcasters on television. So the idea that like, I, I know I'm not the best debater. Okay. One, mostly because, uh, sometimes I get a little fucking, um, sometimes I get a little overzealous. Sometimes I get a little too passionate. I'm also very bad at debating friends. You know what I mean? Cause I don't want to like come across like a fucking asshole. Okay. Like a good faith nature discussion is never going to be is never going to yield the blood sport that you are desperately looking for because that's what people look for in a debate, right? But that doesn't mean that I don't actually fucking debate people. I I often do. I often do because uh it's it's worth it. Most people it's not worth debating. Kelly Ann Conway was merely saying the quiet part out loud when she coined the term alternative facts in which the truth is subjective and the narrative is all that matters. What it, it, you're saying it's a falsehood and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave- Your best debate? Oh, against Schlatt? My name is Schlatt. I fucking destroyed this fool, dude. I destroyed him. <laughs> Doctors without borders? How about we have some border security? Hassan would be the unbeatable right wing grifter if he kept this up. Yeah, if you want to see, if you want to see like, uh, you know how how well of a conservative grifter I could be, just fucking watch this video. It's hard though because like, it, it's hard because you know I I do do get into it. You know what I mean? I get into it a little bit. Alternative facts. This isn't new. Modern debaters are using a playbook that's so old it's written on wax tablets. Now, the ancient sophists believed that man is the measure of all things, meaning that reality is up to subjective human judgment. The ultimate contrarians, sophists theorized that the truth is irrelevant and only the quality, or better put, the perceived quality of the argument is what matters. Now, in other words, fake it till you make it, and if you're good enough at arguing to make us believe it's true, then congrats, you win. Now, while ancient philosophers sought to cultivate and embody wisdom, often through a sort of self-interrogation, sophists were more interested in winning arguments for prestige, power, and fortune. Politicians, lawyers, and tired parents have embraced this mindset for thousands of years, but today it's become particularly potent for debate bros. In such divisive times, it's easy to feel like persuading people is futile, but persuadable voters still swing elections. However, it's unlikely folks will be persuaded by something like uh, this. For second, okay. it's also country by country because you're only talking about America because you're American and you don't see outside of the world. That's fine. I'm, I'm Turkish, well, actually. I grew up in that's Turkey. Not um, that's not the point. That's not the point I'm making. So despite their namesake, why are debate bros so bad at... Okay, what the fuck? Why, I, I'm not being portrayed in a positive light at all. This is like, why am I being portrayed with debate bros online? I am not a debate, debate. bro. Debate. Well, uh, let's, let's, let's try to explain it, you know, while we're here. We might as well. So rule number one of being a debate bro is that, get ready for it, it's not actually about debating, bro. It's kind of wild that this Wisecrack video verbatim quotes my assessment on debates, okay? Bar for bar, verbatim. Like, I've said these exact same things time and time again while simultaneously portraying me as a fucking debate bro. Like, what, what is happening? Bro. Now, the arena of debate isn't a forum. It's a stage, and arguments are won by performance rather than substance. Writer and scholar Moira Weigel explained that while she considers substantive disagreement important, social media is a terrible medium to reach productive resolution of disagreements. However, there's no better medium than social media for boosting your brand by dunking on your opponents and shooting out snappy sound bites. Are there no godless artists and poets? Well, there are artists and poets who think they're godless. Now, Ben Shapiro admits to as much, almost verbatim. So the only other reason that you should ever have a conversation or be friends with anyone on the left is, and, and not even be friends, is if you are in public in front of a large audience, and then your goal is to humiliate them as badly as possible. So to earn the respect of their communities and gain more followers, debate bros argue their opponents into submission. They also challenge journalists or experts to debates. When the expert declines, because let's be honest, ain't nobody got time for debates longer than the extended editions of the Lord of the Rings, the debate bros conclude that they were too scared. Although in reality, it's like challenging the rock to a push-up contest. And then he says, no, cause he's filming Fast and the Furious a thousand. And you're like, oh, you coward. 
The winner-take-all culture of online debate encourages a level of brutalism in which bros will do anything to prove they are the smartest, quickest, and best. The desire for these qualities can- Like, every single clip that they've posted of me is either, like, me going after a dude who's, like, at the peak of his fucking prime brainwashing children into being more misogynistic, or me being sucked in to a conversation by two dudes who want nothing to do with anything, okay, who are just there to, like, publicly fucking air me out, and I had to defend my positions. Like, it's not... This wasn't even like a serious debate. The winner take all culture of online are the smartest, quickest, and best. The desire for these qualities, conversely, makes them far less receptive to any challenges to their points of view, which is sort of the whole point of debates in the first place, right? You should change your mind in the face of a better argument. Now, debate bros employ a variety of performance tactics to look like they've won without actually debating, like moral grandstanding. When debate bros flag and zoom in on opponents' mistakes or misspeech and then blow it up into a moral outrage. Oh my god, I so I agree with this so much. I hate this. This is literally this is a perfect summarization of everything I've ever said about why fucking debating is so annoying online. Getting fucking clip chimped. And then like at that point, it turns into who can clip chimp shit and like blast it into the fucking orbit faster. Who can go out to market faster on LSF and other subreddits so they can com completely dominate the narrative? And at that point, it's like not a single, not a single fucking uh, piece of the conversation matters at all. There are still people to this day that will come in here and be like, remember when you said don't call the police when uh, there's a rape happening or some shit? When I have never in a million years said that. Even the clip chimp of it doesn't even fucking uh, come close to it. And and yet, still, people still say that. People, like, always do this shit. To combine metaphors, they split hairs to make a mountain out of a molehill. Now, does this completely distract from the court arguments? Yes, of course it does. And that's the point. And a way to earn points in the eyes of the judges aka all of us monkey brain folks who are more inclined to listen to whoever we feel dominates the moral high ground it sounds a little something like this you brought listen hey listen you're the guy who sits like this over talking is another effective tactic that is exactly what it sounds like by turning up the volume and interrupting opponents before they can complete their argument debate bros control the pace and narrative of the conversation the most surge but like 18 to 28 just because is... they're the, okay just because they're the most popular doesn't mean it's the most popular it's category it's... however this isn't as easy as simply screaming over the person they're debating debaters do best when they interrupt strategically and sparingly lest they appear like the bully that that they're definitely being. Ethan is Another a debate bro, that's so funny. Has a pretty awesome name is the fire hose of falsehood. This was a Soviet propaganda technique in which a large number of messages are broadcast rapidly over the news and media without regard for truth or consistency. This technique has been modified for online debate culture in which debaters with time constraints who can't possibly debunk all their opponents' claims turn on the fire hose of falsehood to just blast their opponents with a combination of yeah, gish galloping. Facts and bullshit until they're just soaked and overwhelmed and stunned into submission. Debate bros also love to embrace the ad hominem fallacy, in which they attack the person instead of the argument. You've come on here deciding you really want to stick up for the chicks and maybe, you know, one of them will drive over to your house. Now, this is especially nasty when a debate bro attacks folks from marginalized communities because it encourages their fans to do the same. Unless you think we're only implicating conservatives, this approach is often perpetuated by leftist online debaters who mobilize fans against individuals from communities that they supposedly support. Now this- There ain't no fucking way. Yeah, there ain't no way they're talking about me in this- Highlights one. that while many would like to believe that the internet is an open marketplace for ideas, it's simply not a neutral playing field. Moira Weigel, who we mentioned earlier, explained that unfortunately, people who get harassed online are not surprised because they know it from their offline lives. That is to say, they've experienced the same racism, sexism, homophobia, and so on in the real world as they do in the digital one. Debates and competing arguments are, as we discussed, the foundation of democracy. 
The fact that people can pull varying conclusions from the same set of facts based on their subjectivity isn't a bad thing. It contributes to a wealth of ideas that can, if debated carefully, help lead us all to better conclusions. Now, the common refrain that facts don't care about your feelings ignores the very basic reality, notably argued by Hegel, that feelings absolutely influence the conclusions you derive from facts. Now, if feelings didn't matter, Hassan, you are a debate bro, though. You try to deny, but you only want to debate people when you know you sure for sure will. And it's totally okay, in my opinion. I personally like the blood sport, and I learn a lot from them. But you try to separate yourself from that crowd, and I think it's totally accurate. I say this with peace and love. Wait, first of all, like, which is it then? Because I'm willing and able to debate anyone and everyone that I think is completely worthwhile to debate. If we're talking about, if we're talking about Ben Shapiro... Perfectly valid. I would love to debate Ben Shapiro. Said it time and time again. Steven Crowder. Love to debate Ben Sh uh, Steven Crowder. I've said it time and time again. If you're talking about like some random fucking person, a person that I otherwise would most likely agree with on a lot of issues, for example, that you want me to debate on some fucking minutia, I'm not going to touch that. You know, I'm trying to be honest. I wasn't trying to be rude. No, it's okay. You, you're trying to be honest. I'm not shitting on you. I'm simply, you know, trying to... Uh, explain to you what my genuine perspective is instead of your assertions because your assertions are wrong. Okay? Like, I've said, and, and for the record, I have not ever, ever in a million fucking years changed on this narrative either. I think that debates can have utility, they can have value, they can be good to like teach people your talking points so that they can use it in the wild. Okay. But overall, but overall, I'm not going to sit there and waste my time as someone who did a lot of debates. Okay. In the beginning, I'm not going to sit there and waste my fucking time. Uh, just like debating every Tom, Dick and Harry and turning debate into the content in and of itself. Okay. Because there are a lot of people who do that. <clears throat> I was just trying to express my opinion, but I'm willing to own when I'm wrong. I, I think you're wrong on that. Like, I don't know why you uh, wanted to say that I only go after people that I know personally for sure I will win, which implies that there are people out there that I know personally I will lose to, okay? While I personally do not believe that I am the most skilled debater out there, something I readily admit, there are plenty of people who I have debated, even those who you're probably trying to sneakily remark, which you can find plenty of content on. It's literally on my YouTube if you'd like to see the performance on your own, okay? But the reality is, I'm not going to fucking sit there and, like, debate every Tom, Dick, and Harry so I can be fucking ass-blasted by psychopathic, uh, you know, cyber stalkers for years on end, which hasn't really stopped. Regardless, it's completely outside of my power at this point. This in and of itself does not mean that, like, I'm like, oh, man, I'm so terrified of, like, losing a debate, you know? I think... I think Ben Shapiro is better at rhetoric than myself. I think he is a good debater. Okay? I would still absolutely fucking lutely love the opportunity to debate him. Jordan Peterson, I was going to debate Jordan Peterson in Oxford. In like one month from now, I was supposed to fly to England. That's how willing and able I was to debate someone like Jordan Peterson. And he was the one who backed away. Think about that. You guys know this. I talked about it. That's how willing I was to go debate. I was going to fucking fly to England, dude. Imagine going to England specifically to debate someone. I don't think Chatter understands the magnitude of who the debate bros are and what they do. We're talking about people whose entire content is getting into arguments with other terminally online people. Your content is leftist agitprop and you debates if and when they will contribute to that project. 100%. That's exactly my take. 
100%. I do news commentary. I am willing and able to engage in debate if the situation demands it. Okay? Also, I do recognize that uh, admitting that I would fly to England to debate Jordan Peterson doesn't do a lot for my argument that I'm not a debate pervert. Okay? And you still enjoy the blood sport from the sidelines too, though, is also kind of cope because I rarely ever watch debates nowadays anyway. I don't even do that. I watch like Jubilee videos and shit. I guess that's what you, if that's what you mean. But there are a million fucking debaters out there that make debate content and I rarely ever watch them. And part of the reason why is because I don't think it's like that good unless it's like directly about politics. You know? after all, pathos or emotional appeal wouldn't be such a crucial aspect of effective rhetoric in the first place. Now, one of the problems with online debate is that it obscures the influence of persuasion, thus creating a paradigm where someone is necessarily right and the other wrong, rather than one of subjective and often valid disagreement. What we lose by framing debate as mere competition between winners and losers is an opportunity to clarify our arguments, be open to modifying our point of view, and to learn and grow. Online debate culture doesn't commit us to expanding our thinking to encompass what's right or true, but rather to double down on how we argue that our thinking is already right or true. While online debates aren't inherently bad, the culture surrounding them is pretty toxic and doesn't promote greater learning or introspection as much as an increase in blood pressure. Now, part of the problem of why we've become so focused on being right is that being wrong can be socially punished with humiliation and irrelevance. Now, for someone like Socrates, not knowing for certain was hardly something to be ashamed of. At the very least, healthy debate requires listening in good faith and responding thoughtfully to the argument, something that some online communities sometimes mischaracterize as cowardly or weak. A debater who genuinely seeks truth, not victory, concedes points and admits when they don't have an answer. Um, sometimes I feel like I should do a stand, uh, like standalone video like this where I fucking just do like my thoughts on debate culture or something like that. And just do like one fucking 10 minute video, just like a banger on it. Kaya. No, no, that's not a chew toy. That is not, that's my chair. Kaya is eating her me. Dr. Glenn Rawson explains, when we correct others and even take time to confront and refute them, we can follow Socrates' lead and reveal our own ignorance as well in the hopes that we are genuinely siding with humility against arrogance. Organizational psychologist Adam Grant takes this notion a step further in his book, Think Again, in which he argues that being proven wrong can actually be a life-enhancing experience. Grant recommends individuals embrace thinking like a scientist instead of a preacher, prosecutor, or politician. When we're in preacher mode, we defend our sacred beliefs by delivering sermons or ranting. In prosecutor mode, we recognize flaws in other people's reasoning and martial arguments to win our case. And in politician mode, we try to win over audiences by lobbying for their approval. Thinking like a scientist, on the other hand, requires that we be actively open-minded by searching for reasons why we might be wrong not for reasons why we must be right and revising our views based on what we learn. Ultimately, even the most civil and rational debate can't solve all of our societal woes. We can't and won't always find consensus by talking it out. Sometimes debate is pointless if neither side is willing to listen. Now, all that being said, debate can be a source of valuable information. That is, if we can learn to treat pointed questions as tools for gaining a better understanding of the world, not proving that we're kings of the logic universe. So while it may be fun, it's probably best to be realistic about how much anyone's actually gaining from the endeavor. 
Hey, what do you all think? Is it worth it to spend our time debating online or should we look for more rewarding discussions elsewhere? And if you found more rewarding discussions elsewhere, let us know where. Now we look forward to all the civil debate that you're all gonna have in the comments below. I'm excited to brew a fresh cup of coffee the morning this video comes out and at 10 a.m. Pacific time, look with glee at the civil debate that unfolds. Now a huge thanks before we go to all of our patrons. Um, you mean a lot to us. Um, and if you're interested in getting all of our videos early with no ads, extra audio and video content, Discord server, things of that nature, consider joining. Um, there's a link in the description. It really helps us out a lot and it helps us be less dependent on the algorithm and data and big tech and future capitalism and everything. Um, but even if you, you can't be a patron, just by being here for watching, commenting, liking, subscribing and all that other stuff. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know. Wisecrack is, is a fan of the show and a friend of the show, I think. Um, but they weren't, like, shitting on me. It's just, like, I think they were shitting on the people I was talking to. But still, it just, like, comes across like I'm a, a debate, bro. I'm portrayed in that light.